seems like uh, quite a lot of the audience is, uh, is watching the movies instead of shopping up here. It's a bit uh, shame on them, I would say. <laughs> uh, <coughs> today I'm going to talk uh, a bit about location in, in urban areas. Um, and we are again using a theoretical framework that was developed, let's say, uh, up to a hundred years ago, and even a bit more than that. But uh, it it works quite well in explaining um, parts of the location behavior that we kind of observe. Last time we talked about. Uh, Weber's location theory, which was more directed towards, uh, let's say, <coughs> heavy industries, manufacturing industry. We talked about hotelings location theory, which could contribute to explain <coughs> location in, in physical space. Uh, and also location in a, in a more virtual space, where you could, <coughs> one can use that type of, uh, of theory to, to understand how uh, services <coughs> that also compete with each other can, uh, can, let's say, adjust to each other, like airlines, <coughs> like uh, TV programs and so on. This is more about, <coughs> sorry, this is more about location in, in urban areas. Uh, and the division of different functions in the urban space. And we are now talking about the physical space. So why do we have certain activities located in the very central part of the city? And, and uh, why do we have uh, let's say other types of activities more in the outskirts of a city, in the surroundings? <coughs> you will uh, please also pay attention to to the readings. I have specified the page numbers in the in the in the list, and uh, the reading starts and stops in the middle of chapters. So you just pay attention to to the directions that are given in the in the in the lecture plan, and you should it should work. I think. So what we <coughs> what we observe in um, yeah, sorry the pointer is gone, but I can there it is. Is that land prices tend to fall with increasing distance from the city center? So it's a. Uh, it's cheaper to buy land uh, way outside of a city uh, instead of, uh, of buying the same amount of land close to the city center. That is uh, a knowledge that we, we can easily obtain if we look for a house or something. We, we see that this mechanism is at work. And we also see <laughs> on average that the average land area occupied by each household or company tend to increase with distance from the city center. So, uh, <coughs> and, and outside of the urban area, you have the farms, you have the fields where people grow different uh, vegetables and uh, keep, uh, keep the cat cattle and so on, cattle. So, obviously, this is something that, with some exceptions, of course, works quite well. We see these uh, these patterns. And uh, <coughs> I will show you then two, two models. One from 1826, it's nearly 200 years ago, by von Thunen, a German engineer and economist. And <coughs> the bid rent model, which builds upon von Thunen. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a development from, from Fontaine's model. 
uh, and uh, it was formalized by Alonso Mills and Muth in 1964 and onwards. So it's not more than 50 years old then. The <coughs> this uh, framework is not it's not very complex. This is uh, an illustration of uh, where we have distance along the horizontal axis and we have the price of land, price of the commodities and the, uh, the rent or the, uh, the land use costs that a given industry or company may have. So what we have here is, is a commodity where the market price is $100 per some unit, per unit or per weight unit or, or whatever. Parts <coughs> of that uh, you can get $100 for your product. Parts of the costs are related to fixed non-land inputs, which are uh, could be uh, technology equipment, production equipment, and it could be labor. Not related to the use of land. So, <coughs> in a in a fairly competitive economy again, where you don't have much of monopoly profits, you are left with a maximum of $50 that, you, that you can pay per unit of land. So if you are located in the city center, <coughs> you can pay 50 because then you are in the same place as the market. That is the assumption here, that, that the market here is in the, in the core in, of the city. So this this theory by Fontaine was developed in an agricultural economy where you had small villages, people lived in the city center and they did their uh, business. Some did their business in the city center by perhaps running a, a, a pub or a food store or something like that. Whereas the production, the farming took place outside of, of the center. <coughs> and we have transport costs, which are essential in this, uh, in this, uh, in both theories. So we have a transport cost of one dollar per kilometer. So we see that as you move out from the city center, the transport costs make the maximum ability to pay for the use of land diminishes. So when you <coughs> when you are here at uh, 50 kilometers outside of the city center, the land rent is zero. So then <coughs> we can say that in this very simplified case, you will not have any any ec economic activity uh, outside of uh, let's say a concentric circle of 50 kilometers. In the city center, the willingness to pay for land will be 50, and uh, at the margin it will be zero, and the margin is at 50 kilometers. And if you think about it, and if you, if you look at, let's say, this small city, uh, you'll find that uh, housing prices is, is quite steep in the center very expensive. Uh, but if you move, let's say, uh, some 20 kilometers outside, it's much, the, the, the prices are much lower. If you have a, let's say, a, a, t a road toll on a, on a connection to somewhere, let's say to, to an island from a city, the housing prices of the island will be lower 
and they will be lower if you have the road tolls uh, imposed on this uh, this road link from the city center out to the island. If you uh, if you uh, remove the tolls, the housing prices will go up, and that is it's uh, it's very solid evidence for that from empirical studies. So transport costs are affecting the, the land use costs here. And if you <coughs> consider an increase in market prices, then you get a, a shift in this distance land use, uh, low, uh, the distance land rent cur curve out in the from the origin here. In this case, the market price has shifted upwards with fifty dollars, and uh, that can be a result of uh, many forces. It could be uh, a shift in consumers' preferences if this is, is if this happens over time, or it can be a shift because you get a uh, let's say new big company that moves to the area and that happened here some uh, eight years ago or something where this uh, were a big processing plant for uh, for uh, offshore natural gas was established here just some kilometers outside of the city center so I think it's reason to say that when that happened, we got this this shift because uh, because the uh, economic activity level increased and uh, and the willingness to pay for let's say certain types of services increased increased increased. So the land use costs, and you can translate that to housing prices, inc increased quite sharply. because of the demand situation. So if you think in terms of, let's say, an uh, input-output study, where as, uh, as we examined some weeks ago, and you get a sharp increase in, in the activity level, you may get a pressure on the prices. This curve may shift up outwards. The land use costs are uh, increasing. The housing prices are in the area is, is increasing. They are increasing. And we see that the, the point where the land use costs are zero is moving from 50 to 100 kilometers. And we see that in the new situation, um, with a land use cost of, of $100, we are at this point 20 kilometers outside of the city center because of the transport costs, which are still <coughs> one dollar per, uh, per distance unit per kilometer. We get this, uh, guess this pattern. We can examine a third situation where transport costs are uh, are reduced. In this case, reduced from uh, one to zero point five dollar per kilometer, and we get, let's say, the same impact in terms of or or a consequence in terms of the extension of the let's say the area the built area around the city center because transport costs are, are reduced so if you remember the when i talked about american cities and uh, car use and the very sprawled, dispersed 
population in the bigger American cities, with some exceptions, can be easily understood from this, uh, from this illustration, where transport costs means that people can, com can commute over a longer distance, and uh, the structure becomes much more dispersed than if we have high transport costs. And of course, when you <coughs> expand the area of which people can sort of commute and still be able to pay a certain uh, price for the land, uh, <coughs> the land value will, will increase, not in the city center, because uh, here the transport costs are, uh, are zero, but uh, as you move out from the city center, the land values increases. Which gives incentives to, for property developers to develop uh, suburbs and, uh, and everything that goes, goes with it. It's not, it's not, it's not very difficult to, to get the intuition behind this, but Fontaine was the first one that formalized it, in a way. Yep. Uh, can you give an example uh, for the reasons why the transport costs would be reduced? Would it be uh, a decrease in uh, economic productivity? It is more a question of improving the road network. Uh, like we see in many uh, many American cities, where you have the big the dual carriageway uh, motorways, no uh, or very little congestion. You may have, for instance, uh, an improved rail link, subway, everything that can make the transport flows uh, more reasonable to people. Um, I was involved in a project a couple of years ago in, in, uh, in the Oslo area, where we tried to find out what will be the consequence of having a high-speed rail, not, not a real high-speed rail line, but let's say uh, doubling of the average speed from, let's say, uh, 60, 70 to 120, 250 kilometers per hour. And what will happen with the urban structure around Oslo if you expanded or, or uh, let's say, reduced the transport cost then? And that may not, <coughs> and you have to bear in mind that it is not only a question of how much you pay for the for the t for the fares for the tickets, but it also includes time, and it may include uncertainty. It may be that it's uh, it's very cheap to travel during uh, during daytime, but you may have congestion problems during uh, peak hours in the morning and the afternoon, and all this affects the the spreading of uh, of the of the city. Or the, all the, or the built area around the city. So what, what remains here as, uh, as land rent is then the revenue from, from, the, from the outputs minus non-land payments, technology and, uh, and labor, if you are running a company, and minus the transport costs. This is applied to the production sector. But I will uh, show you later on that it can also be applied to the private sector, how people choose to, to locate themselves when we turn on to the, to the bid rent model. And um, one could also imagine 
a situation where you have not only one product, because this is very simplified, it's just one product, and the, and the diminishing willingness to pay for, uh, for land. But you could also have two products. And again, this is, uh, this is uh, Fontaine from 1826, so he dealt with, with uh, ag agriculture. And two types of, uh, of grain, barley and wheat. With two different market prices, the same <coughs> amount of fixed cost uh, related to technology and, uh, and uh, I guess, horses and the labor force at the time. Uh, we see the maximum payment for land when all the fixed costs are paid for and the market price is taken into consideration is 50 and hundred dollars <coughs> respectively. Fifty and hundred. And uh, the transport costs are uh, one dollar for the wheat and 2.5. It's much more expensive. Don't ask me why, but we can imagine reasons for that. Of 2.5. And then we, we can draw the land rent gradients for the two products. And we can draw some conclusions from that. One is that up to this point, we will have barley produced closest to the city center. We will have, we will have the barley. And outside of this point, we'll have the wheat up to 50 kilometers from the city center. So we have a kind of a functional division of activities, production activities, depending on market prices, transport costs, and uh, we could also have uh, have the f uh, differences in fixed cost incorporated here. But we see that the slope of the land rent curves depends on the transport costs here. Uh, if any of you have read this and have a kind of a critical view of the numbers, there is one. I think there is one mistake in that figure. Uh, <coughs> and the mistake, I think, is connected to this point here. It says 25 kilometers. And you can uh, easily formalize this and try to find out where is this point located. And if you take then the, the land rent curve for wheat, the, the upper one here, we can say that the, the equation for that one should be uh, 50 minus 1 times d. And this is the price of transport, and this is the distance. And that should be, in that point where these two curves intersect, should be equal to 100 minus 2.5d. Right? So this is the intersection point. And if you solve this, you'll get d equal to 50 divided by 1.5. And that is not 25. It's uh, equal to 33 kilometers. And you can actually see it from the, from the graph that it is, uh, it is skewed a bit to the, to the right, so I th the graph is correct, but uh, the intersection point is not correct. And we also see that since uh, 
transport costs are 2.5 dollars per ton for uh, for barley we will not have any barley produced more than 40 kilometers outside of the city center where the market is because it will be too expensive to to pay the transport costs to get to the to the city center So in uh, <coughs> on a general in general terms, we can say that the land rent at location is equal to the to the yield ton per acre what you get out of your production capacity. In this case, it is land times the net uh, profit that you get, which is the market price minus the production costs, and then minus the the yield that you need to transport to the center, times the transport costs and the distance. So uh, when you are going to buy a house or a flat somewhere and you can say that well it's very very expensive to 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 live in the city center it's a very expensive flat so i need to to go a bit outside of the city center and buy a cheaper flat there and the flat is cheaper because of the transport costs and then you can try to to work out because it's easy to get the, the distance to where you usually go and you can try to calculate whether it is really a good deal to to live outside of the city center instead of buying the higher price of living in, in the in the very central areas. And then you can take the costs of car ownership and the future in uncertainty connected to fuel prices and road pricing schemes and everything. And you can get a very interesting decision problem of where to where to live. So I, uh, <coughs> my my son, who, who is who bought his uh, his first flat uh, a month ago, I said to him, "You should really look into this and try to work out whether you should really." go for the cheapest solution way out in the in the outskirts of the city and he chose to buy a slightly smaller flat in the center <laughs> based on calculations i have a bad influence on him now i think well, remains to be seen whether he will be happy with that but i guess i will hear it if he will not be happy with that solution so this is uh, this is a kind of uh, functional split between various uh, types of production we have grazing which is to provide uh, food to the to the animals on the, uh, at the farm uh, with a very low market price and a very low l land uh, rent even in the central areas and then you have the different you can have wheat you can have dairy products milk cheese and so on and you can also have the the residential areas where people live and you get the functional split. Residential areas in the city center, you get the production of, uh, let's say, refined agricultural products a bit outside. Uh, and then you get the wheat, and then you have the, the grassland outside of that again. And the intersection point can be points can be calculated by means of the formulas that I just showed you. I'll give you another example of, of that. 
a bit later on. So any questions before we make it a bit more complex? Yes. It shows, given given the, the willingness to pay for each of the types of, let's say, products or activities here, and given the transport costs for, for, uh, for the activities, and that it's uh, it's reasonable to to consider the transport cost in terms of let's say weight units uh, <coughs> and you may have a high even if you have a very high market price for let's say if wheat then have a very high market price uh, this is what is left when the fixed costs are paid for or the land independent production costs are paid for, like labor and, uh, and capital. So this is just the land rent curves for just land. So even if the market price for wheat will, could have been up here, then the difference would have been connected to the uh, production factors that are not land dependent. So, uh, so this looks... Uh, and then you have the transport costs. Uh, once you have determined the maximum willingness to pay for land in the center, and then the slope here is connected to the transport costs. And it's of course an, uh, an empirical question to determine the, the level of the transport costs. It's, uh, it's not necessarily so that uh, that grass is cheaper to transport than wheat, but it's just shown here as for, for illustration. And then if, uh, if the shape of the land is, uh, let's say, symmetric in all directions, you will have this as circles, concentric circles around the city center. But if you remember back to the to the Weber location theory from last time, these circles can be not circles but shapes dependent upon the transport network. And if you let's say in this direction here uh, construct or build a railway or a motorway, these circles will be affected by that. Because then the <coughs> if you ex uh, expand the quality of the transport uh, system in terms of reduced transport costs, then these, <coughs> these curves will, all of them will then rotate and you will cover a larger part or a larger area in the direction where the transport system is improved. So we actually applied this way of thinking to say something about the future of the urban structure in the Oslo area. As a consequence of, uh, in this case, an improved rail system. But it's uh, in in practice, and I will come back to that uh, a bit later. But in practice, it's uh, it's always difficult to say. I mean, these is these are nice curves and uh, circles and things, but in 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 real life, it's more, much more messy than this. And there are other factors that also affects the willingness to pay for, uh, for let's say, for, for uh, residential location, which uh, has to do with uh, preferences for, for instance, uh, 
having access to cultural institutions, to education, and everything that that can contribute to a higher willingness to pay for land in the central business district. But <coughs> then the the pattern will be that the land use costs per square meter will increase and the sizes of the of the flats tends to decrease. So uh, you have a substitution effect which I will uh, which I'll work a bit with when we turn to uh, to the bid rent curse. Because <coughs> here we are allowing for substitution between land and other factors. It can be production factors for companies and it can be uh, perceived as, let's say, quality factors for residen residential areas, access to culture, cinemas, theaters, restaurants, and so on. So, but uh, the work by these three guys, Alan Samuelson, was also, w that work was also occupied with the production sector, manufacturing. So there ha they had also this, this as point of departure, but not agriculture as such, but more manufacturing in the 60s. Manufacturing was again what <laughs> that's what you did in the in the urban areas. So if you some of you may be from towns or cities where and if you think back say fifty years, you none of you can think back fifty years in uh, being you haven't been around for fifty years but from history, you can perhaps or can perhaps observe that activities close to the city center has shifted in in uh, actually in what they do, what what type of economic activity is surrounding your hometown now as compared to what was the situation let's say 50 years ago. In this city, Molde. The manufacturing industry was located very close to the city center. And some of it still remains. But some of it is about to move, uh, and some of it has already moved. Or they may have downscaled the part of the production uh, activities that takes place in the urban area, in the s close to the city center, and taken a lot of the activities to locations further outside of the city center. And that is because land in urban areas has become very expensive. And it's not it's not longer feasible to use much land for activities that has rather low returns per square meter. I'm not saying that the industry has low returns as such, but per square meter in urban areas. They are not able to compute with the consultancies, the lawyers, the wealthy people that wants to live there, the, the shops, which can have a lot of activity on a rather small amount of, of, of land as compared to a, to a manufacturing industry. So there has been a, a shift of activities. In my, in my hometown, which is called Tansberg, 100 kilometers south of Oslo, there is one company left that do heavy manufacturing in the central business district. 
The rest is gone, replaced with, uh, with upmarket flats. And it's a question of time before the last one will go, I think. It will take more than, I think, within 10 years it's gone. That's my, my guess. And the same with a couple of uh, companies in this city. I guess within 10 years they're out of, of the central areas of, of the town. So <coughs> this is uh, again a link between distance and, uh, and the rents per square meters. It has a curved form that gives zero profits. It's the same as for the Fontaine. The land rent curve is showing where the maximum willingness to pay for land or ability to pay for land, which, which gives the company or the, or the farmer zero profits. And it's the same here. So the slope of the curve here is given by a, a negative uh, relation between distance and uh, or transport costs and uh, and the land value that is actually used the land value of the land that is actually used at any point in space and uh, in this case the uh <coughs> the land value per square meter increases sharply towards the city center and it diminishes. The same, let's say, logic that transport cost matters. But you can have a substitution effect between land and transport costs, um, land and other production factors, which gives this, uh, this curved uh, pattern. I will show you uh, how this substitution mechanism works, but I think we uh, we break now, and I will continue with that in the next section. <laughs>